Thank you, Pastor Brendan. All right, if you have your Bibles and you follow along in your Bibles, open up to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we'll be looking at verses 34 and 35. Tonight, or today, we're going to look at the new commandment, the new commandment. Now, if you recall the last opportunity I had to speak, which was a while ago, so you probably don't recall it, but let me remind you. Uh, my topic was on the new covenant, the new covenant. Now, the new covenant of the blood of Jesus. See, we gained an understanding of the significance in sharing in the sacred sacrament of the Lord's Supper. See, Jesus took the Passover meal and gave it a new meaning. The bread now represents his body and the wine represents his blood. Today, we will see how Jesus takes a long-standing commandment of loving your neighbor and makes it new. See, there's a profound connection between the new commandment and the uh, new covenant. It will become clear that to follow the new commandment, you must have been washed in the blood of the new covenant. Again, to follow the new commandment, you must have been washed in the blood of the new covenant. They cannot be separated. The truth about the new covenant in your life determines your will and desire to follow the new commandment. See, love is an expression of an internal reality. Love, true love, that I demonstrate outwardly is formed by my personal relationship with Jesus. But I want to clarify something. This is a commandment. Jesus is not making a suggestion. He is not asking he hopes or that he wishes you do this commandment. No, it is a command to love one another. So during the next moments, we're going to be able to reflect personally and see how are we fulfilling this new commandment in our lives? See, what the world needs now is not love. See, I, th I know where your mind was going, right, with that song. What the world needs now is what? Love, love, love. No, it's not just love, but a love that comes from a heart that directs its worship to the true and living God. Now, the context of John chapter 13 is that Jesus has just meeting with his disciples and he washes their feet and he tells them that whoever wants to follow me must be a servant. Jesus says, look, I've been with you now for three years. You have watched me. So now I tell you, go and love one another just as I have loved you. Then hours, just hours later, Jesus is arrested. So over the next uh, few minutes here, I'd like to answer four specific questions relating to this new commandment. First of all, why is this a new commandment? Now, if you'd like to follow along and take notes on the back of your bulletin, there is a brief outline there, so you can follow along there. But the first question is, why is this a new commandment? Secondly, is what makes this new commandment so relevant today? Third, where are the warning signs in our culture? We're going to look at some warning signs of our culture. And then th fourthly, how do we fulfill the new covenant? Jesus says, love one another. How are we able to do that? So before we pray, let's read our text as you find it in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. It says this, the word of the Lord. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love, have love for one another. 
Love one another as I have loved you. See, love is an interesting word in English, isn't it? You can love a hot dog, <laughs> right? Man, I love that hot dogs at that place, right? Or you can have a love and hate relationship with the sports team. You can love your spouse or you can love a friend. Now, obviously, we're not using love in the same way in all those different uh, circumstances. But by contrast, in the Bible, in the Greek language, love is differentiated by different words. And predominantly, predominantly in Scripture, the word for love can be either agape, which is a God love, or phileo, which is a friendship love. In John 13, Jesus is talking about agape love, a God love. And agape love can only be accomplished by those who have the presence of God in their life. Those who have allowed the gospel to transform them, those who have been born again. Well, here's a couple verses uh, to help us see this truth as it's laid out in Scripture. 1 John Chapter 4, verse 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if you look closely, you will see that this verse is saying that knowing God is the basis for how you love someone else. If you know God, you'll love your neighbor. But what standard do we use to measure whether we have loved someone or not? Well, the standard of all love, of course, is God. It begins and it ends with him. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, four, verses 4 to 5, these words, it says, But God, rich, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Wow, what a God. What a God of love. All right, so our first question is, why is this a new commandment? Why does Jesus say a new commandment I give you? Well, because, you see, loving each other is not new per se. It already has existed in the Old Testament. We read in Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What makes John 13, 34, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, new is the words that Jesus adds being, as I have loved you. You see, I've highlighted that phrase, as I have loved you. These are the key words. See, when Leviticus was written, the full gospel of Jesus, particularly his life here on earth, was not known. But now, in John 13, Jesus has demonstrated, he has modeled, and he has lived out this command to love one another and, with, and will fulfill all of its meaning when he ultimately dies and rises from the grave. You see, what makes it new is that now Jesus is the pattern. He's the pattern for how we should love each other. And it's also new because it is a command to love by living out of the love of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, we go to John chapter 15 and read these words in verses 9 to 10. As the fathers loved me, this is Jesus speaking, so have I loved you. Abide in my agape. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my agape. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his agape. You see, as the Father loved Jesus, so he has loved us, and he asks us to love him according to that pattern. All right. We also read further in 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 to 21. There's about eight or so verses here. Follow along with me, if you would, on the screen. It says, by this we know that we abide in him 
and he in us because he has given us his spirit. That's the relationship of God. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. All right, we just continue on with just a few more verses. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Just as I have loved you. You see, in a beautiful, providential way, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all planned the greatest demonstration of love. A selfless, gracious, merciful love to show us how we ought to love each other. That is agape love. All right, second question. What makes this new commandment so relevant for today? What makes it so relevant today? In a book I read by Thaddeus Williams, Uh, Don't Follow Your Heart is the title of it, and I recommend the book. The author's claim, after extensive research, says, and I quote, the world's fastest growing religion is the worship of the God of self. The truth of the matter is that we live in a society that loves themselves. We have misdirected love to ourselves rather than to others. That is why it's so relevant today. See, the fastest growing religion is not Christianity. It's not Islam or some other group. It's the worship of self. That's why we must be reminded of a new commandment to love others. I think it's obvious that the majority of people today have a misplaced love. Don't you see that in our culture and in society? And this trend is very alarming, very alarming. But it's not a new trend. It's not new. Here's a warning that we see out of back from Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 59. It says this in the New Living Translation. Behold, listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to call, uh, hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are the hands of murderers, and your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews corruption. Whoa, those are some strong words by Isaiah. But he's calling his people, the people of Israel, to accountability. The nation of Israel had become a self-serving nation, worshipers of self. They have put the true God, per se, on the shelf, and they started worshiping their own interests. And it doesn't end very well. Isaiah continues on, and in chapter 65, he writes these words. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am. 
to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices. In other words, they were self-serving. And folks, unfortunately, we are just as guilty today. Here's a contemporary example which demonstrates a decline in our own culture and society over the last 20 years. This happened around 20 years ago. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments that we find in Exodus chapter 20 have taken a hit in our culture. Have they not? They've taken a hit. They used to be put in almost every courtroom in our, in our uh, country. Well, not so anymore. See, way back in 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled five to four in McCreary County in Texas versus American Civil Liberties Union against the display of the Ten Commandments in the courthouse, saying it violated the First Amendment, which is the so-called amendment of the separation of church and state. See, the battle, though, is being played out in the courts is just a symptom. It's just a symptom of a bigger problem being the removal of biblical authority from everyday life. The denial of absolute truth and the overemphasis on my rights. My rights. See, now morality is subjective in our culture. Because people, by and large, no longer believe the Bible. They are following their own wicked hearts. Our Thursday men's Bible study has been going through the letters of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, if you think that churches today have some problems, just read First and Second Corinthians. And, and there's two verses that highlights the issues of their day. And what I would like you to do as you read these words, consider and draw the parallels to what's happening in our own culture and our own society, all right? I read these verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You can get socially canceled by saying those words today. Do you see what they say? They say that if you are continually living habitually active in the context of these sins, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. These sins are a result of self-worship. But there's good news. There's good news. See, by a transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can learn to be selfless, and ultimately live a life worthy of the gospel. All right, now let's go to the third question that says, where are the warning signs in our culture? I gave you just a glimpse of some warning signs. We're going to look at a little, a uh, few others. We all, regardless of our official religious identity, have a tendency to place ourselves at the center of, of our own existence. Think about that for a minute. How you do that, right? Well, we tend to do that. And the author calls it a God delusion society. Here's what he says. He says, according to research, 84% of Americans believe that the highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible. So whatever it takes to enjoy life as much as possible, you do that. 86% 
believe that to be fulfilled requires you to pursue the things you desire most. 91% affirm that the best way to find yourself is by looking within yourself. Are you kidding? Has no one read Ecclesiastes? Right? All of this is vanity unless it's directed first and foremost to God. And none of those have any reflection on God. See, the American society of today has replaced the t biblical Ten Commandments with other commandments that are much easier to follow. And social media happens to be the avenue of where millions and billions of people are getting their inspiration and direction. How many of you are on social media in some way, shape, or form? Right? Probably the most of you probably are. All right? I'm going to show you a slide that, that illustrates uh, the truth about the social media, the top 10 social media sites. And here, it, they're showing us the active users on a monthly basis. Facebook is number one. If you can read that, I'll read it. It says 3 billion, billion active users on Facebook every month. That's over a third, that's about a third of the whole world. The whole world are being informed through Facebook. YouTube, 2.7 billion. WhatsApp, 2.7 billion. Instagram, 2.4 billion. TikTok, 1.5. LinkedIn, 1 billion. Snapchat, you got Twitter at 619 million active users every month. Pinterest, and then last is Reddit. Do you see that? The majority of people today are being informed more through social media than I believe God's word. Well, if you were to uh, create a list of 10 commandments based on what social media is promoting out there, uh, these came from the book I had read, so I'm going to share them. And you will see that each of the topics, each of the topics uses a hashtag. Now, what is that hashtag that's in the, in the front of it for? Well, the hashtag is used to set it apart as a phrase or whatever topic it is. It sets it apart and creates it as a linkable topic so that when you send it at the end of whatever you're tweeting or commenting on, it is sent in the context and you can search it on any of these media, social media platforms. So I am calling these 10 uh, commandments, cultural commandments, the USA cultural commandments of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. All right? So here's number one. Live your best life. Thou shalt always act in accord with your chief end, to glorify and enjoy yourself forever. Number two. Okay, boomer. A lot of you are boomers here. What does that mean? Thou shalt never be outdated, if you're feared to be outdated because you're a boomer, but always on the edge of the new. Yeah, don't be afraid to get the next newest thing that comes out. Then you won't be outdated. Number three, follow your heart. Oh, this is so contrary, right, to Scripture. <laughs> Thou shalt obey your emotions at all cost. <laughs> Number four, be true to yourself. Thou shalt be courageous and enough to defy other people's expectations. Be courageous, even if it defies other people. Number five, you do you. <laughs> Thou shalt live your truth and let others live theirs. Haven't you seen that today? What's true for me is true, and what's true for you is true. That's fine. Let's, we can live like that. No, folks, we cannot. Number six, YOLO. You know what that means? You only live once. 
All right? You only live once. Thou shalt pursue the rush of boundary-free experience. Number seven, the answers are within. Thou shalt trust yourself, never letting anyone oppress you with the antiquated notion of, quote, being a sinner. Wow. Number eight, authentic. Thou shalt invent and advertise thine own identity. Mm. Can't you see that happening today? Inventing your own identity. Number nine, live the dream. Live the dream, folks. Thou shalt force the universe to bend to your desires. And then lastly, love is love. This is how the world looks at it. Thou shalt celebrate all lifestyles and love lives lives as equally valid. Oh, folks, that's not love, is it? These are the problem within our own culture and our own society. You say, how can this happen? How can this happen? Well, here's a theory from the author. You see, uh, during, during the 1960s, Uh, During the 1960s, it became trendy and mainstream to interpret the constitutionally protected, quote, pursuit of happiness in a highly individualistic, subjective, psychological light as the right, even the entitlement, to make my three best friends, me, myself, and I, happy. See, many believe that a right to life, liberty, and happiness would lead to a better society. Why wouldn't it? But what is actually happening is our society is in decline. According to a leading psychologist, David Myers, he's documented since the 1960s these facts, that America has doubled the divorce rate, We have tripled the teen suicide rate, quadrupled the violent crime rate, quintupled the prison population by five times, sextupled by six times out of wedlock births, and seven times we have multiplied the rate of cohabitation without marriage. All this to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Kevin Conkren from Northwestern here, close to us, sums up the research rather bluntly. He says, it seems the more we desire happiness and pursue it, and consume products we hope will help us achieve it, the less happy and more depressed we become. All right, that leads us into our fourth question. How? How do we fulfill the new commandment? How do we love one another? Well, first and foremost, it begins with a relationship with God. Without a personal relationship, the commandment to love is just a subjective moral guide for us. It may make you feel good about yourself and others, but it does not benefit the ultimate destination of your soul. See, without Christ, you would have fulfilled his words that he said in Matthew chapter 16. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. Pastor and author John Piper puts our relationship for God and others in these terms. He says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If God is not our ultimate satisfaction, then we are only making ourselves and others into idols and worshiping man and not the creator. In the King James Version, it uses the word affection. In uh, Colossians 3.2, it says, set your 
affection, which is your satisfaction on things above, not on things on the earth. Our problem today is that we are elevating our desires over the desire to please and glorify God. We satisfy ourselves first to the point where we exclude others and God. We are worshiping the God of self. Here's an illustration. You know, when we go flying in the airlines, the stewards often, they all have to give us uh, instructions in case there was an emergency. One of the instructions is, if the cabin were to somehow decompress, the oxygen masks would fall down. And what you're to do is you're supposed to take the one that's right above you first, put that over your mouth, put it, uh, the little strings over your ears, and make sure it's functioning. You do that first, and then you help the person that's sitting next to you. All right? Why do we do that that, that way? Well, it's because if I'm incapacitated in some way, then I become useless. And I can't help anybody. So I've got to make sure that I help myself first, and then I can help somebody else. Well, the problem is our society and our culture has really uh, twisted that all up. And here's what happens today. We grab the mask, we put it on, make sure we're breathing well and we're all happy, and we forget about the people next to us. We just flat out ignore them. We're being so selfish, so self-focused, that we don't even care about their outcome. Why? Because it's me, myself, and I. Let them worry about themselves. But Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. So how has Jesus loved us? Well, we see in John chapter 15, 13, 14, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus modeled us to us what he expects of us. That's true discipleship. He walked this earth teaching and serving and embracing people. He was other-focused. Jesus tore down barriers of hate, ministered in fellowship with the marginalized and the oppressed, and invited those who wanted to follow him to do the very same thing. See, out of his love for us, Jesus spoke the truth about God and preached a message of repentance and eternal life. And then ultimately... Ultimately, Jesus demonstrated his love for us. He humbled himself and he went to the cross and laid down his life. So the pattern of love to be followed is clear. It's humility and it's service out of a loving heart. But most of the time, we don't, can't do that. We're not naturally wired sometimes for that. We need help. We need a power that helps us do that. Well, fortunately, God's given us that power. And we get that power from the verse that we read in John chapter 15, verse 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus is the source of our strength and our courage to, lo to love others. All right, here's our application to take home today. Here is the application that we can use to show love to other people, to stop worshiping self to ultimately, first and foremost, honor, glorify God first, and then every, everybody else. Here's a rewritten of the Ten Commandments. And I've only rewritten five of them, but I think they can help us as we go forward. First of all, 
Number one, live your best life as God intended. As God intended. We read in Philippians 1.27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Number two, follow his heart, not your heart. Please don't follow your heart. Follow his heart. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Number three, be true to God. Be true to God. In 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Fourth, the answers are in the Bible. There's so many verses I could have shared out of Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 19, 119. But overall, Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And then lastly is number five, love as Jesus loved. Love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag and it is not arrogant. Love never fails. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to gain further understanding of your word, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for sending your son as a gift to us, even though we didn't deserve it. We were spiritually dead, as your word says. We were enemies with you, yet you loved us. You reached out that olive branch to us and said, I love you. Trust me. I pray that be true for our, all our folks here today and those that may be listening or watching online that we would trust, put our faith and trust in your son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation, and that we would not worship self, but honor and glorify you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.